In this video, I'm going to go over the basic features of the angiosperm life cycle. In order to best understand the life cycle, the first thing that we should do is make sure we understand the anatomy of the diagnostic feature of angiosperms, which is the flower. We're going to start by labeling some of the features that are not directly involved in reproduction. So for example, we can start with the petals. Down at the base, we can think about the sepals. And lastly, the structure that supports the flower itself, which is the receptacle. Next, let's label the female parts. So we're going to start at the top with the stigma. Below that is the style. Then we're going to think about the ovary here. And last but not least, the ovule. Now a couple of these I just want to elaborate on a bit. The ovary really is this entire structure here. The ovary wall is what's eventually going to develop into fruit. And the ovule, at this point, is the megasporangium surrounded by the integuments. Together, these parts comprise the carpal. On the male side, we have the anther, the filament, and together these form the stamens. Now this is an example of a perfect flower because it has both male and female parts on the same flower. Keep in mind that we're dealing with the multicellular sporophyte generation here. So all the parts we've talked about so far are diploid. The next step in the process is to produce spores. So I'm going to zoom in on our ovule here and make a quick sketch. So if I was to be looking inside the flower, and then inside the ovule, what I would see is the megasporangium. All the parts here shaded in green are part of the megasporangium. The megasporangium is enclosed by the integuments. And so together, these two parts comprise the ovule. Just to round this out a little bit here, that would be our stigma. And of course, down here we could put our sepals, etc. Inside the megasporangium is a special cell which is going to divide to give rise to the megaspores. We call this cell the megasporocyte. The megasporocyte is what is going to undergo meiosis to give rise to four megaspores. So I'm going to zoom in on our ovule here. And we would see four megaspores.
that there was not enough nutrition to allow for the development of all four megaspores. So three of them die by programmed cell death or apoptosis. The last surviving megaspore is going to undergo mitosis to produce our fully developed female or mega gametophyte. The mega gametophyte of angiosperms is highly reduced. So it only includes seven cells and eight nuclei. So here are our seven cells, and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nuclei. The parts of the megagametophyte have specific names. This first cell here is the egg. It's flanked by two cells, which are called synergids. The middle cell is the central cell, and you should notice that there are two haploid nuclei there. So its ploidy isn't N, it's N plus N. And then last but not least, we have three antipodal cells. The whole structure is still surrounded by that protective layer that's derived from the sporophyte called the integuments. One thing that should be remarkable to you at this point is that we've transitioned fully from a dominant gametophyte stage like in a bryophyte to a gametophyte that is only seven cells big. So there is this remarkable trend in plants which is the shrinking size of the gametophyte. If I zoom out here and focus on the male side, what I'm going to see is if I take a look at just one anther, just like on the female side, there is a microsporangium inside of which there are many cells that we call microsporocytes. Each cell of which is going to undergo meiosis to produce a special structure called a tetrad. And this is a tetrad of microspores. Unlike on the female side, each microspore is capable of surviving and further divides by mitosis into the male gametophyte, or the microgametophyte, which we call pollen. Now that we have the basic elements in play, I'm going to reorient our life cycle here and focus exclusively on the flower itself. Remember that angiosperms have a close association with insects. There are some that are wind pollinated to be sure, but they're famous really for having close pollination strategies with insects. I've repositioned our flower here at the bottom and drawn in the features of the female part of the flower which once again we call the carpal. And the idea here 
is that insects are going to deliver our pollen to our stigma. Once the pollen has been delivered, it's going to grow a pollen tube that extends all the way down into the ovary and it's going to deliver two sperm. Two sperm are delivered because one sperm is going to fertilize the egg and the other sperm is going to fertilize the central cell. Recall that the egg was haploid, so that makes pretty good sense there. Now we have a diploid zygote. But the central cell, which was here, was N plus N. Now that we've delivered that other sperm, this is now a triploid structure, which grows into the nutritive tissue for the developing embryo, which we call the endosperm. And so to simplify, what we really end up with is our flower, that contains our newly formed zygote that's diploid, surrounded by a bunch of 3N tissue. which is the endosperm. That zygote is going to continue to grow by mitosis and eventually form an embryo. And that embryo is the next sporophyte generation. And so it's diploid. And surrounded by nutritive tissue, which is 3N, called the endosperm. Eventually, the walls of the ovary will ripen. And the ripened ovary is what we call the fruit. This structure eventually closes off at the top. And you can imagine some remnant leaves hanging off of here to make our fruit. Keep in mind that the seed is still surrounded by the integument layers. So the combination of the integument, the embryo, and the endosperm together are what we refer to as the seed. Once again, although there are lots of parts in the life cycle and lots of little steps, it's important to keep in mind that we are still following the basic alternation of generations life cycle. Seed plants are all heterosporous to be sure, and there are complications that are built in here, but in order to follow the life cycle clearly, 
it's important that you keep track of each step. Sporophytes make spores by meiosis. Spores grow into gametophytes by mitosis. Gametophytes produce gametes by mitosis. Gametes fuse to make a zygote, and the zygote grows into the next sporophyte generation. Obviously, what stands out from an about angiosperms from other plants is the formation of fruit and the presence of a flower. Remember, the seeds are enclosed and protected not only by the integument layers, which eventually form the seed coat, but they're also surrounded by fruit in order to facilitate dispersal. Lastly, keep in mind that the embryo is nourished by a new kind of tissue, triploid endosperm. And the endosperm only forms as a product of double fertilization. In gymnosperms, this is a bit different. In gymnosperms, this, the developing embryo feeds on the remains of the megagametophyte. So it's already produced. That plant is already invested regardless of whether or not the egg is fertilized. However, in angiosperms, we only produce endosperm and thus nutritive tissue once fertilization has actually occurred. So in that way, you can kind of think of angiosperms as having a little bit more efficiency in their life cycle.